How's it going guys, Mike the Gaming Dad here and welcome back to the channel. So this video is one I've had on my mind to do since I did videos on the Anniversary Edition new homes and the Anniversary Edition new armour sets. This video is going to cover off all of the new weapons that were added into the game. I'll also outline if the weapon is part of a quest and briefly explain how to complete the quest steps to obtain them all. I hope you enjoy. So the first couple of weapons are actually tied to one of the Anniversary Edition homes and can be obtained at the same time. And this is the quest for Dead Man's Dread and can be started by reading the book The Restless in the Winking Skeever. The first part of this quest leads you to Castle Dower Jail, whereby you can either choose to get arrested to gain access to the jail or convince the guards to let you in, which if your speech is high enough is the easier and quicker of the two. Your next destination after Castle Dower is the coastal shipwreck Orphan's Tier, which will be inhabited by a gang of Blackwater brigands led by Celeste. Kill Celeste and you'll then be able to retrieve the Blackwater Blade, a cyrodelic steel sword that carries an absorbed 30 points of stamina enchantment on it. Not a bad enchantment I'd say for power attack builds, but there are better weapons out there. Once you have picked up your first new unique weapon, climb aboard the small boat to sail to Blackbone Isle. Now you can explore the island if you wish, but the shoreline is bleak and crawling with undead, so just head inside. The grotto is similarly filled with skeletons, and here you'll find the ship, Dead Man's Dread. Fight your way through the ship's undead until you reach the captain's quarters, and here you'll find the captain's journal, as well as Cyrus's sabre hanging above the desk. And this is the second of the unique weapons in our list. Take the sabre and loot the chest next to the captain's bed to obtain Cyrus's clothes and boots, all three of these need to be taken to progress the quest. The main thing I noticed about the sabre is its damage to weight ratio is actually quite good, so it'll swing faster than a normal sword allowing you to deal more damage. It has no enchantment though, but for fans of previous Elder Scrolls lore, you may choose this one, as Cyrus is the protagonist in the Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard. The quest is supposed to depict what happened to Cyrus after he sailed north to the Sea of Ghosts. And finally, both of the Dead Man's Dread editions can be improved to grindstone with steel ingots. For the next couple of new weapons, we need to get to Candle Half Hall in Windhelm. Upstairs on one of the small round tables in the corner will be a journal belonging to Adonato Liatelli. Read this to begin the quest, Caught in a Web, which takes us to Kronvanga Cave in search of two heroes. Kronvanga Cave is quite easily spotted, just head for the cave surrounded by giant web sacks and spider webs. Now if you aren't a fan of Skyrim's frostbite spiders anyway, you probably aren't going to enjoy facing the web mother too much. She's absolutely enormous and moves much faster than the smaller spiders. But the spirits of the two heroes will join the fight. I mean look at her. All kinds of nope. But once the web mother is dead though, the heroes will walk to their corpses. Investigate Holric's body and you'll find the Ice Blade of the Monarch, a really nice looking greatsword with a frost damage enchantment on it. The blade also places a 50% slow enchantment on the enemy for 3 seconds which is nice. Now investigate Grenwolf's body and you'll find the Fists of Randagulf. These are not technically a weapon, but their enchantment makes them one if you prefer unarmed builds anyway. The Fists boost your block and two handed skill by 20 points but they also increase unarmed damage by 20 points, so this means you'll punch like a truck, although there are other craftable gauntlets that outrank them later in the game. Again, both of these new additions are improved at a grindstone with steel ingots. To find the fifth weapon in our list, we need to head to Forelhost, an ancient Nordic ruin just south of Riften, and actually one of the Dragon Priest locations, for anyone who wants to collect all of those. Now there is a quest here given by Valmir, a high elf posing as an officer, but the weapon we are looking for isn't linked to this quest, it can just be done at the same time. Once you reach the end of the Nordic Temple and have dealt with the Dragon Priest Ragot, you can exit through the door which takes you onto the Forelhost Battlements. It's on here at the Word Wall that we find a ghostly figure named as the Lost Paladin. Take the Paladin down and on the remains we find the weapon Chrysomir. And this is another throwback from previous Elder Scrolls games. Chrysomir is a legendary two-handed sword that appeared in the first three titles. The sword has enchantments which grant a 15% resistance to fire and 10% absorb magic. But I think it's unique as it also grants a buff to health recovery during combat, 
which may lend itself to survival mode, although I haven't tested this out. To improve Chrysomir, you'll need an ebony ingot and a ruby, which is rare as I think only a couple of weapons require both ingots and gems to improve. Weapon number 6 in our list takes us to Stony Creek Cave, and this place is interesting as we'll be coming back here later on in our list as well. To find this location just head north of Anselvund. Towards the end of this small cave network you'll find some bandits. Take out the chief, but be careful as he wields the weapon we are after. And this is the Ruin's Edge Bow, a Dark Seducer Daedric artifact which randomly applies one of five effects to the target. These are Frost, Demoralize, Frenzy, Drain Magicka or Paralyze. So it can be quite fun to play around with, if a little unpredictable. One thing I have noticed with this weapon is, if like me you find archery easier in first person, you might struggle with this bow. It's so massive that I find it can get in the way of your vision, so this bow I actually use in third person when using it. But as I say, it can be great fun to use though. Of the list so far, this is comfortably the weapon I've used the most. Taking on large groups of enemies can be great, as frenzy will cause enemies to start fighting one another. Demoralize will cause them to cower or run away, and paralyze sits them down. The other two enchantments aren't as useful, which is a shame, but it's still a great bow. And to upgrade this weapon you need a Daedric Heart. Although you don't need Daedric Smithing to temper it fully, just the Arcane Enchanter perk. The next weapon in our list we actually need to craft ourselves, and to start this we need to head to the Retching Netch in Raven Rock. A mysterious note is pinned to a keg to the left of the entrance, along with the Fork of Horripilation. Reading the note will start the quest, put a fork in it. And this quest comes from Shiogarath, the Daedric Prince of Madness, and we need to use the fork to kill two bull netches. One is to the southwest and carries the Eye of Surtur, and the other to the northeast and carries the branch of the Tree of Shades. Not bothered about feeling a tad ridiculous, do Shiogarath's bidding with the fork and relieve the Solstein wildlife of the artifacts. Once in possession of both, you'll then be tasked with crafting the Staff of Shiogarath. Now if you don't have access to a Staff Enchanter just yet, the closest one belongs to Master Neloth, and you can gain access to it by completing a favour for him, and then completing the Reluctant Steward quest. In doing so, he'll give you a key to his Staff Enchanter room, and now we can craft weapon number 7 in our list, and the first of the staves. Fans of Oblivion may remember this staff as the one wielded by Shiogarath himself in the Shivering Isles DLC. In Skyrim its effect is to paralyse the target for 10 seconds. And it does look awesome I think, I'm a big fan of the design of this one. But in terms of practicality, it's more style than substance I'd say. It can be fun to sit things down and cause mischief around town, but in actual gameplay it tends to stay in the inventory for me. Weapon number 8 and the second staff in our list. To get this one first head to the small bandit camp which is nestled in the rocks west of Whiterun. I actually already had this quest in my log, but your first visit here you'll find a smuggler's note which starts the quest, the staff of Hasadoki. Your first quest marker takes you to an ambush site which is located along the road west of Whiterun. And here you will find an orc, Modig, who you will need to either kill or pickpocket to obtain the ledger. Reading this will reveal the location of the buyers, two necromancers who are located in Brittle Shin Pass. Now with these, I find it best to take them down silently if you can. One of them wields the staff and can be annoying to face if she keeps knocking you down with it. But once they are dealt with, you can claim the staff for yourself. Now as well as looking pretty awesome with its blue skull tip, this Morrowind staff might just be one of the best staffs for mages in the game. It has a 60 second soul trap enchantment, knocks enemies over and has a ward effect when not firing. You can actually see the ward effect here just in front of us.
The knockback effect is actually awesome though. We actually killed this Sabre Cart with it, which I wasn't intending to do. But what I wanted to demonstrate with this is you could wield this with a weapon in your other hand if you wanted. Which will allow you to get strikes off whilst your target is immobilised. This spider we are dealing with here is Nimhi. Remember them? You don't have to actually kill this spider to get weapon number 9 in our list. But I recommend it as it will make retrieving it a whole lot easier. And this is because the weapon is located inside Kelselmo's museum. Killing Nim here grants you access, whereas you can break in here if you wish. It's just the guards will be hostile towards you unless Kelselmo has given you a key. But once we are in, the weapon is located in this far corner, and this is Stendar's hammer. I mean, look at the size of this thing, and it weighs 100. No, that isn't a typo. Maybe I should have used this weapon for Tiny, my heavy two-handed tank. But anyway, this weapon looks awesome, and it deals reasonable damage, but the weight makes it hard to justify using unless your stamina is crazy high. This is because weight doesn't only determine carry cost, it affects stamina drain when power attacking, and swing speed. It's great fun using it, I'm not sure I'd fancy being on the receiving end of one of these to the face, but it swings so slow and will eat your stamina bar for breakfast. But still, if you wanted to wield this, to improve it, you need an ebony ingot, a flawless sapphire, and the arcane blacksmith perk. Weapon 10 in our list actually comes as two versions, and to find this one, just head to the Atronach stone. Once here, if you look northeast, you'll notice down in the hot springs over there, there is a small black pool. When you approach this, you'll notice a skeleton in the blackness, and the weapon Shadow Ren will present itself to you. And you can see here that the weapon changes between a greatsword and a battle axe. In order to pick this up though, you'll first need to defeat your shadow in battle, which begins the quest through a glass darkly. My shadow didn't really put up much of a fight there, did he? But anyway, now we can retrieve Shadow Rend. I think out of the two versions, the sword is my favourite. I like the smoke effects both weapons give off. Now when I first read about this weapon, I saw the enchantment and thought, oh brilliant, that would work great for a spell sword build. Weapon in one hand, spell in the other. But no, both options are two-handed, which I think is a shame, as who's going to be attacking with this and then switching to magic? I guess if you want a follower who wields magic, it helps, but otherwise I think it misses a trick. But anyway, this is the axe version of the weapon, and both have the smoke effect on them which is pretty cool. But yeah, this isn't one I've used personally. I'll keep the sword version though, and you can change this at any time by returning to the pool with the weapon. And to improve Shadow Ren, you need an ebony ingot and the arcane blacksmith perk. The quest for the next weapon in our list begins in Windhelm in the new Nissis Corner Club. On the bar area will be a note entitled Lost Caravan Guards Note, and reading this will begin the Legends Lost Quest. And this quest actually has quite a few stages, which will lead us across Skyrim locating various caravan wreckages, and it's well worth reading all the notes to learn the background to the story, but eventually the trail leads us near Falkreath. The final wreckage gives the player an attunement crystal, and a letter which reveals what the cargo was, Sunder and Wraithguard, legendary tools of Kagnarak. And the letter's author managed to track the items to a vault located in Sightless Pit, and the attunement crystal will unseal the vault. Sightless Pit is located southwest of Winterhold, and parts of this subterranean world always remind me of another underground location near here. No prizes for guessing which one that is. Use the attunement crystal to gain access to the vault, and then once in here you'll need to solve two steam puzzles, whereby you have to move the escaping steam along, and eventually restore steam to the system. Once done, open the gates and prepare yourself to face off with a giant dwarven automaton named the Messenger.
Once defeated, you'll be able to enter the centre area and claim the weapon and glove for yourself. Now Wraithguard raises resistance to shock, fire, frost, magic, disease and poison by 10%. And it also increases health and stamina by 20 and magicka by 50 if Keening is equipped. And it increases one handed damage by 15%, stamina regen by 50% if Sunder is equipped. Sunder deals 5 points of frost, fire and shock damage in addition to 15 stamina and magicka damage. Now unsurprisingly both items can be improved using Dwarven Metal Ingots. With Dwarven Artifacts though, I always think they stand out like a sore thumb when used alone. But if you pair these with a full Dwarven set, like the updated Anniversary Edition here, I think these look pretty awesome. I might be tempted to do a Dwarven build using this weapon and glove, but we'll see. Weapons 12 and 13 in our list are both staves, and to obtain these we need to head to the extreme north to Sky Temple Ruins. Just within the temple entrance here you'll find a body of a mage, Hyenril, and he won't be carrying anything of note, however on the table in front of him will be the Arm of the Sun and the Arm of the Moon, plus the Warlock's Mark Amulet and his journal. Read the journal to start the quest, The Arms of Chaos. Now you'll notice if you look at the two staves, neither is complete nor has any enchantments, and this is because we need to locate the sigil stones to restore them, and to do this, first we need to head to Windhelm to find information on a lost ship, the Sea Stallion. Reading the note here, we learn that the ship sank at Pilgrim's Trench in the Sea of Ghosts. Time to get wet, and probably not wise to do this in survival mode. Swim down to the trench to find the coffin of Elaine and this contains the Sovereign Band which we need to be able to summon the Dramora to get the Sigil Stones. With the ring in our possession return back to the island where Sky Temple Ruins is and summon the three Dramora, and you'll have to defeat all three in battle, but each one will be carrying a stone required to restore each artifact. The Warlock's Mark amulet can be restored at a forge with the Blue Sigil Stone, but in order to restore the two staves, you'll need to locate a Staff Enchanter. And here are the completed staves. The Arm of the Moon contains the green sigil stone and looks awesome. You can see the stone sort of rotating inside the staff, and this staff will either demoralise or frenzy the target, and the Arm of the Sun burns the target for 20 points of sun damage. It also has a 30% chance of frost and shock doing 20 points of damage as well. And for fans of Elder Scrolls lore, both of these are tied to the Staff of Chaos that was central to the plot of Elder Scrolls Arena. And they look awesome I think, definitely some of my favourite designs within this list. What do you think of my new staves Neloth, seeing as you are the specialist Staff Enchanter? Neloth? No, I think Neloth is secretly raging guys, the apprentice has become the master. In terms of usefulness, I'd probably suggest using one of these rather than both. I find dual staves quite clunky to wield. I'd say the arm of the sun carries more use, the enchantment does do a fair bit of damage if the 30% chance of extra damage hits as well. Weapon number 14 now and for this one we need to head to Champion's Rest. Not far from the entrance in here you'll find a wooden table with a journal entitled Vigilance Report. As always, read the journal to start a quest, and this time it is Vile Whispers, whereby we will have to investigate the dark presence that is haunting Champion's Rest. And this area plays out like most of the typical Nordic ruins, you'll have totem puzzles to solve, plus a fair amount of Draugr to deal with. Reach the end of the ruins though and you'll find yourself in this large amphitheatre and you'll find the ghostly figure in the centre on his knees. Approach and you'll notice that the figure is actually an ebony knight named Umbra. The knight, whose real name is actually Cressitus, will stand up and immediately attack. Now he is immune to all damage while purple and translucent, so during this phase I recommend just keeping your distance. Every so often though he'll summon three soul images to fight you, during which time he'll materialise and be vulnerable to damage. During this phase though, I try and kill at least one or two of the soul images though. Two of them use bound swords, and another will shoot from a distance with a bound bow, so it can deal with quite significant damage if they gank up on you. When he changes back, just keep your distance again and repeat. 
Once defeated, you can loot him to obtain the two-handed greatsword of the same name. In terms of design, this one's fairly basic, resembling an iron greatsword, however it's likely to get more usage than some of the weapons in this list. And that is because the dual enchantment of absorb 25 health and stamina is not bad for a base weapon, and the filling of soul gems is an added bonus. To improve this weapon, you'll need an ebony ingot. Weapon 15 in our list actually sounds like two weapons, and in a way it is. Like Shadow Ren beforehand, it has two forms, and to obtain this one, head to the Ratway vaults underneath Riften. A public notice will be attached to the door, starting the quest as Soul Divided, and the note warns townsfolk to stay out of the Ratway due to rumours of ghostly figures and disappearances. And to locate said ghost, find the room containing Guy and the Fist. The ghost is through the door to the south of this room, and now we can enter the Guardian Vault. Upon entering here, we will be tasked with investigating the vault, and the weapon we are trying to obtain will be seen hovering in the centre of some kind of force field. If you want a more in-depth guide to this quest, watch my video on the tragic quest in Skyrim. I cover this one in a lot of detail in that video, and it's actually a really good one. It contains a ton of notes and journals which all flesh out what happened here, and they are well worth reading. What we will have to do is enter three rooms and each time defeat a ghost simply called the Guardian. Defeating him for the final time will reveal a blade called Laurent Bouchard. As I say, of all the quests in this list, this is one of the better ones I think, at least in terms of story progression. Completing it will reward you with the weapon Dawnfang Duskfang, which changes dependent on the time of day, either doing fire damage or frost damage. It will also absorb health or magicka once 12 creatures have been slain with it. And this is another weapon with a crazy design. If you're a fan of this one though, you can obtain a near identical version of it. There is a note as part of Soul Divided which gives a miscellaneous quest to investigate Faldar's tooth. And in here you will have another note which mentions a buyer for a sword they found, and to take it to Broken Fang Cave. You'll most likely have to kill a few leveled vampires in here. But once done, the sword will be in the boss chest, and this is Bloodthirst, a sword of the same design which absorbs 15 points of health, increases speed by 7% and causes additional bleed damage. Probably strongest of the three to be honest, based on the enchantments. But I mean, if you are collecting both of these, there's only one thing you're going to be doing with it, and that is dual wielding isn't it? Don't mess with this kitty. To improve both of these items, as with the majority in this list, you will require ebony ingots. Weapon 17 now, and probably one of the more well known weapons in this list. To start the quest for this one, speak to Preventus in Whiterun and ask him, is there anything else you need from me? Ah of course, it's all in a note. It's a real shame we didn't get more dialogue with these quests. I can understand why, but always having to read notes kind of ruins the immersion a little bit I think, but oh well. This starts the quest in the shadows, and in this quest we need to play detective, running around Whiterun trying to solve clues as to whether the Jarl is going to be the victim of an assassination attempt. I won't cover every step of this, but eventually you will find yourself up at Silent Moon's camp. A journal written by the assassin, carelessly left out in the open for anyone to read, lets us know of his plan to kill the Jarl in Whiterun. I'd have liked if at this point in the quest we had a timer to get back in time before it's too late, like you can't fast travel, only rush back before he is killed. Amusingly the quest marker points to the exact location of the killer, so aim your bow in this direction and fire away. Loot the assassin to find the bow of shadows, which draws 20% faster and casts invisibility for 30 seconds. I do really like this weapon, I've probably given it a lot more use than some weapons in this list. The invisibility is what gives it the attention, but arguably it's the draw speed that is its main use. Pair this with the perk which improves draw speed, and you'll find you can fire arrows off at a ridiculously quick rate. And this is another of the weapons which requires an ebony ingot to improve. To find the next weapon in our list, you'll need to head to the Sakellum of Boethia. I hadn't completed the quest here, so this automatically started Boethia's calling. But this isn't why we are here though. If you enter the sparring pit, you'll find a body on the floor of someone named Aranya. Approaching her will automatically start the quest, a matter of pride. Read the journal on her corpse to learn we need to locate an ancient warrior's tomb. 
The tomb isn't too far away, Sivda's respite, just north of Windhelm. You can kind of get a taste here how quickly the Bow of Shadows draws. Once these three Boethia cultists are dead, investigate the Nordic ruins for more of Aranya's notes, and this will then send you north to the college to locate yet more of her journals. And this then splits the quest into two parts. We need to head to White Run to get hold of Sivda's amulet from Lars Battleborn, and also head to Iverstead to find his betrayer in Shrouded Half Barrow. The last part of this quest is quite amusing. You can try intimidate or persuade him, but I mean, he's just a kid. Plus, if you offer him like 10 septims, he'll give you the amulet anyway. Sivda's betrayer is actually a dragon priest called Magrathi, who you need to kill and then take the skull of. Place both the skull and the amulet on the pedestals to gain access to Sivda's tomb. And this isn't that long. At the end of it you'll be able to retrieve the katana gold brand. Now let's just deal with the two drow that attack after picking it up and then we'll be able to take a closer look at it. Now as someone who enjoys Japanese history I was drawn to the fact that this weapon was a katana. It's a nice design and the enchantment isn't bad either. Think of this one as your new Dawnbreaker, with the added bonus of no Meridia. It deals 30 damage per hit and has a higher raw damage than Dawnbreaker, although it consumes more soul gems to charge it. Overall a nice weapon I think, and one I'll definitely be using more often. And to improve this one you'll need a gold ingot, which I guess makes sense. Weapon 19 now on my list, and probably one of the weaker ones in terms of the quest to obtain it. You start this one in Shaw Stone, and you need to speak to the scruffy looking red guard here who has his fists raised. I don't know, the quest progression in this one just feels quite clunky and out of place, and the dialogue leaves a lot to be desired. Take this encounter for example, we just talk him down, and he then thanks you and gives you a note, surprise surprise, which begins the quest, Interception. I won't spend a lot of time on the steps in this quest, but first you need to wait until our courier friend shows up, and we are then led to Pure Water Run, whereby we encounter another red guard, and this is Fidja. He will give you more notes whereby you'll need to go off and find more spies located around Skyrim, who will then give you more notes. But once all this is done, the quest does get a bit more interesting. You'll gain access to the supply chest and inside here is a set of the remnant armour which if you have watched my guide on the new armour sets you may remember, although this isn't the unique item we are looking for as part of the quest. The best part of the quest is where you meet up with more of the remnant assassins who you will join in attempting to free the hostage by ambushing some Thalmor agents. You only need to concern yourself with Ismail though, the Thalmor provide short work for the remnants. Ismail will be carrying the unique sword, Bone Shaver. You can take this back to show the White Run guards if you wish. They'll be pleased to know it's curved, like all Red Guard swords. In terms of its enchantment though, I'd say it's mediocre at best. The bleeding damage is low, so useful at low levels, but will do little against tougher foes later in the game. Free the hostage and then return to complete the quest. I'd say the best thing about this quest is the unique armor set. Other than that, it's fairly forgettable. Number 20 is another of the weapons you collect alongside one of the new homes, like with Cyrus's sabre right at the start of this list. And the home this time is Gallows Hall and is located here at Mara's Eye Pond. Now the quest to obtain this home is quite short, but I think it's actually really good and the riddles are unique. When you first enter you'll find the body of a mage here, this is Nara, and on the floor next to her are three pleas and her journal. Reading any of these will start the quest, Dreams of the Dead. Now in order to escape from here you will need to complete a series of trials set by the necromancer and there are a number of clues that will help you along the way. So the first one is over by the map here. The first riddle requires us to pull out the torches in the room in the same order as is referenced in the clue. The correct order is Morthal,
Valkyrie. The Night Gate Inn. And then finally onto Fort Dunstad. When all four torches are removed, the poltergeist stops throwing everything around the room and you can collect the Staff of Worms. The Staff is then required for the next part of the riddle, but I'll pause the walkthrough here. If you haven't done this quest yet, I do recommend it, it's a good one, and contains a few more useful items in it like the Bloodworm Helm. And this is the creepy looking Staff of Worms, which reanimates a dead body to fight for you, one without any time limit. The Staff of Worms is the artifact once wielded by Manny Marco himself, the King of Worms, and the central antagonist in the Elder Scroll Online's main quest. The design of this staff is pretty cool, with the skull and the skeleton hands. Now reanimation may not seem like a particularly exciting ability, but the fact it creates a permanent undead ally is unmatched, so necromancer builds will probably find a lot of use for this staff. It's basically the same as having the master level dead thrall spell. I tested this out and unless killed, the body does actually stay with you. You can even fast travel across the map and go into cities, towns, taverns, wherever, it will still be there. Which raises some interesting possibilities if you can raise a really powerful dead ally with it. All in all, a good staff for the right play style. The next weapons on our list are linked to the Civil War questline, and this contains four separate weapons which is pretty cool, and all are incredibly easy to collect. To obtain the Civil War Champion sets, head into the Drunken Huntsman, and on the bar area will be a note entitled Battle of Champions. Read this to start the quest of the same name, whereby we will either need to pose as an Imperial soldier and travel to Solitude, or deliver five snowbear pelts in Windhelm. Let's start off with the Imperial side first. Lega Adventus has a laughably easy persuasion conversation where we can rock up and be like, Hey, I'm loyal to the Empire, pick me. And he's like, okay soldier. You then just need to tell him that you can handle it and then you gain the Imperial Armoury key. And this opens a chest downstairs, so let's just head down there. Just need to get past this guard who is stood in the doorway, as always. There we go. And now we have access to an awesome looking set, just like that, which also includes two unique weapons. So this is the Imperial Dragon Armour set, which resembles, I guess you could say a Roman Legionnaire with the shape of the shield and the style of the armour, but it's the weapons we are interested in in this video. The first of these weapons is Akatosh's Talon, which is a two-handed warhammer with quite a strong fire enchantment on it, burning the target for 50 points. The next is Dragon's Oath, a one-handed sword which burns the target for 30 points. So not as strong, but it'll obviously swing a lot quicker, and you have the added benefit of a hand free. I do just want to quickly mention with this armour set though, as I don't think I called it out in my armour video. Across all the pieces I think you get a 60% resistance to fire amongst other benefits. And this actually makes this an interesting armour choice for a vampire character, as you will negate the weakness to fire. Just something to bear in mind if you fancied playing an undead heavy knight or something. So this is a complete look with the Warhammer. Pretty awesome isn't it? I do like the Warhammer, it definitely stands out amongst them. And then this is the sword and shield combo. Yeah, I'm definitely getting Roman Legionnaire vibes from this. Or the film Gladiator. Shall we take a look at the Stormcloak version now? I'm just going to get hold of the five snowbear pelts. And you can steal these, but I only had a 1% chance of success, so murder felt like the best option. After presenting these to Izerald, you'll get a similar question where he will ask if you are up to the task. Say yes and you'll get the Stormbear chest key. And this is another set where I think the design is excellent. I mean look at this shield. This set does have slightly different enchantments though, but one of the main changes is it has frost damage and frost resistance in place of the Imperial's fire. The two handed weapon this time is a battle axe and deals 50 points of frost damage, and then the one handed sword does 30 points of frost damage. So this is the completed look with the sword and shield. And this is the look with Soon's Judgment. I think I prefer the two handed axe to this set, whereas I like the sword and shield more with the Imperial Dragon Armour. The detailing on the axe is great, with the Stormcloak Bear symbol on the blade. One thing worth calling out with the Storm Bear set is the effect the helmet has on the overall armour rating. So without it equipped here, our rating is 111, with a plus 25 for the helmet. 
and this actually jumps up by 36 when equipped. Now this build doesn't use heavy armour, so the increments are small, but with heavy armour perks and levelling, the Stormbear set is one of the best armoured in the entire game. The Stormbear sword is a shame that its design is quite bland I think, it looks more like an iron sword to me, but the axe is very nice. And all four of the Civil War Champion weapons can be improved using steel ingots. On to weapons 25 and 26 in our list now, and both of these were added in as part of the Divine Crusader creation. Head to Four Skull Lookout to find these and take out Vipath and her bandits first of all. The main addition with this creation are the Arms of the Crusader, first featured in the Knights of the Nine DLC for Oblivion. You'll find the original set plus the Reforged set inside Four Skull Lookout. Here is Aegon, and this is Orin. Orin will be carrying the first of the weapons, the Mace of the Crusader. What is unique about these armour sets though is they give a quite a lot of bonuses to the wearer, as long as you've not committed any evil actions. Should you equip any piece of the set and be deemed unworthy, the Pilgrim's Path quest will automatically start whereby you will have to cleanse yourself of your sins at shrines all over Skyrim. This isn't something you want to ignore either. The relics of the Crusader reduce your stamina and health regeneration by a significant amount. You'll also have 100 points less of carry weight. This is the original Crusader set though, so if you want to feel like you are back in oblivion this may be the set for you. The mace has a fairly ordinary effect of burning the target for 15 points, so it's half that of the Civil War one-handed weapons we just saw recently. If you like this armour set, but don't want to wear heavy armour, then the Reforged set might be the one for you, this being the light armour version. The enchantments are identical, the only difference is with this set is it uses a one-handed sword rather than a mace, so like all tiers of one-handed weapons, there are minor differences in raw damage, swing speed and weight. This is what the Reforged set looks like with the sword. I think between the two weapons, I like the design of the sword the best, but due to the mediocre enchantment, neither are weapons I can say I've used much yet. And both of these items can be improved using steel ingots. The next two weapons in our list are part of a quest which I have covered quite a few times across this channel, and this is the Saints vs Seducers quest, Balance of Power, which is started by speaking to Resad and asking him about trouble on the road. The first clue to obtaining one of the unique weapons in this creation is found at the Seducers campsite near Windhelm. Once you have dealt with the Seducers, there will be a knapsack inside the tent here. Open this to find a bandit's note on hidden treasure, which will mention an exotic treasure inside Crystal Drift Cave. Here is the cave, nestled in the mountains southwest of Riften. After dealing with the animals inside of the cave, on the shrine there will be a journal entitled Gadnor's Last Wishes. Read this and you'll learn you need to place one amber and one madness ore in the ashes near his resting place. Once you have these in your possession, place these and the first of the unique weapons will reveal itself to you. And this is the two handed weapon, Nerve Shatter. If you've watched my two handed build, Tiny the Tank, I use this weapon in that build. Aside from looking pretty damn awesome, if you pick this up after level 30, it has the equal highest base damage of any two handed weapon in the game. And the enchantment is the same as the Of Storms enchantment, so it's a fairly strong base enchantment. Definitely one of the best weapons in this list visually though. To get the second unit weapon in the Saints and Seducers add-on, you'll need to continue the quest further, to the point that you need to enter Solitude Sewers. Once down here you will find the entrance to a root cave underneath the city. When you have dealt with the Mad Conjurer Thoron, you will be able to claim the weapon from the tree over here, and this is the Sword of Jigalag, a rather nice looking two handed greatsword. It doesn't carry any enchantments, although it can be enchanted yourself if you want it to. Now the sword is an artifact associated with Jigalag, the Daedric Prince of Order, and it appears in the Shivering Isles DLC for Oblivion, wielded by Jigalag himself. I would probably use this sword more, but I feel like the first time I played Saints and Seducers, it probably got overshone a bit by Nerve Shatter. It even looks enormous when carried on your back, and it's great for smashing skeevers. Take that skeever. 
the ultimate pest control weapon. To upgrade Nerve Shatter you'll need refined amber, which we haven't used up to now, and the Sword of Jigalag can be upgraded using an ebony ingot. On with two more quests to go now, but these are two of the largest, containing nine weapons in total. The first of these doesn't start until you reach level 46. This is the cause, which is tied to the events of Oblivion, whereby you will be tasked to investigate rumours of the construction of a new Oblivion gate by the reformed Mythic Dawn. This creation starts off like a lot of quests, travel to A, read this, travel to B and so on. It's at the point you find the excavation leader's journal, which directs you to somewhere called Riel, that the quest starts to get a bit more juicy. Riel is a moderate sized Aelid ruin located beneath the Gerald Mountains. Once inside you'll be tasked with finding four Aelid elemental shards so you can access the crypt. Think of this area as your high elf version of the Nordic crypts. Aelid whites will patrol the halls instead of Draugr and so on. They are creepy looking though. I think I find these worse than the Draugr. And this is what one of the elemental shards looks like. When you've found all four, place them in the correct places and you'll be able to enter the burial chamber. And once inside, grab the Great Welkin Stone first and then prepare yourself for a boss fight as the sorcerer Norian the Undying will burst from his sarcophagus. He can do a lot of damage with his staff so watch out, but once he's dealt with, loot his remains to find the first of the three unique weapons in the cause. This is the staff of El No Ede, whose enchantment is similar to Wall of Storms, but with added drain stamina. Fun fact for you, El No Ede means mortal end in the Aelid language. It is quite a nice staff, I think. Pressing on with the questline, you'll eventually encounter Vigil Enforcers who are pressed on stopping the Mythic Dawn in opening a new Oblivion Gate. A journal found on one of the dead Enforcers tells us where the Oblivion Gate might be found. Fight your way through the Mythic Dawn guarding the entrance to finally locate the Gate and Vonos, leader of the Mythic Dawn. Defeat Bonos, but the Oblivion Gate will open, which will start the follow-on quest, The Consequences, where we will need to stop the Mythic Dawn's plan by entering the realm of Mehrun's Dagon. Time to enter into a new area, the Deadlands. Now despite resembling Mordor, this area isn't too bad. There are new alchemy ingredients here, and it's a good area to farm a few rare ingredients which I will get onto shortly. First of all there will be two Dramora here that we need to defeat, and each will be carrying one of the unique weapons. Gatanas will be carrying Scourge, a rather scary looking mace which has the ability to send all but the strongest Daedra back to oblivion. And Methats is the second of the Dramora. Defeat him in battle to receive the third and final unique weapon here, Torment, which is about as close to a Dramora's blade as you're ever going to get. It has Crimson Daedric script embedded down the blade, and it burns the target for 30 points of fire damage, so it's the equivalent of the Dragon Oath Sword. You can now leave this area, but if you wanted to stick around and do a bit of farming, this place is great for Daedric Hearts and Fire Salts. Both the Atronachs and the Daedric Horses will drop the latter. When you do exit the Deadlands, your final task before the quest finishes is to escape Red Scar Tavern, as the remaining Mythic Dawn cultists do battle with the Vigilant Forces. So here is a closer look at the two weapons we obtained down there. Both nice designs I think. Definitely would be good additions for any Daedric builds. And both of these can be improved at a grindstone using ebony ingots. On to our final quest now, but this is arguably the largest and best of the lot, containing a whopping 6 new unique weapons. 
To start this quest, travel to the temple in Raven Rock. Head downstairs and in the first room on the right you'll find a dossier entitled Blacksmith's Confessional. Read this to start Ghosts of the Tribunal. The first place we need to visit is the Forge Room in Falbathars. Kill the heretic stalking this room and on his corpse you'll find a Forge Gem. We will need four of these in total later on. Read his handwritten note which details a weapon he was trying to reforge here. He will also carry the weapon, although at the moment it is unenchanted. Finally, he has the substance required to create the enchantment, plus his unique helmet and robes. Grab all this to start the second quest here, True Flame, where we need to restore the blade's enchantment. You can apply the substance to the unenchanted weapon here, however without all four gems we can't progress any further, so we will come back here later. First, wear his robes and infiltrate where the heretics are holed up. Speak to the matriarch here to receive three new quests, by the wear, careless curation and her word against theirs. These are all fairly simple to complete, the latter just requires us to get a letter translated by someone in Raven Rock. Once she has the letter all you have to do is wait two hours for it to be completed. So. You can then either distribute the letters amongst people, or give the letters to the temple priest and tell him heretics were trying to spread these. Now Bayer Beware tasks us with following a Redoran guard after nightfall, but you can just wait an hour and then go to his location. He travels to the cellar in the old Atias farm. Kill him and the buyer at this location to receive the second of the forged gems, plus the mask of Vivek, which we will need to obtain more of the weapons later on. The final quest, Careless Curation, actually takes place back on Skyrim, and this will direct you to Kagrenzel to find the missing curate. You can actually just travel to Stony Creek Cave to find them, however if you have ever wanted to feel like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, go to Kagrenzel and then stick around. That's a, uh, quite the fall, isn't it? If you do elect to go this way, you'll need to fight your way through the Falmer infested Kegrenzel interior, but it's not too long. Once you reach the other side of Stony Creek Cave, you'll find the Cura held hostage by some bandits. Free her and she'll give you another of the masks. Oh, good job. Here, my way of saying thanks. You want something from me? Now with all three tasks completed, go and tell the matriarch who will give you yet another note, yay, which will start the Ashen Heart quest, and this will require you to investigate the Tribunal Armory Room, and there are a ton of things for us to pick up in here. Firstly, there is the third of the Forge Gems, plus a priest's note which mentions a mannequin puzzle in the Armory Room. The puzzle itself is fairly simple, just place a mask of Sothasil on the mannequin to the left. Leave the one in the middle, then on the mannequin on the right place a mask of Vivek, and this will open up the chest. In here will be the first of the six tribunal weapons, Hope's Fire. Hope's Fire is a weapon that has appeared both in Morrowind in the Tribunal DLC, plus the Elder Scrolls Online. It has a curved blade which reminds me a bit of an ancient Egyptian sickle. Its shock and magicka damage enchantment is okay, but I think this one looks great though. There are three more weapons to pick up in this room though. In the display case on the right there will be the Light of Day Mace. Uh, there's nothing in this one. Then in this one there'll be a two-handed warhammer skull crusher. And then in this display case here will be the two-handed sword Mage Bane. The Light of Day is a spiked mace that's unique as it cannot be wielded by vampires and it deals very good damage to undead targets. The enchantment deals 15 sun damage per hit but this is tripled for the undead. Mage Bane as its name might allude to is a fantastic weapon to wield against wizards. Its raw damage output is low compared to some of the other greatswords, 
but it deals 60 points of magicka damage, so will be crippling for magic users. And finally Skullcrusher is a Warhammer that deals great stamina damage per hit. 30 points of stamina damage in conjunction with raw damage of 28 makes this a powerful weapon against most enemies. And let's just take a look at these three weapons close up. This is the mace. I mean, it's a little on the small side, isn't it? Honey, I shrunk the mace. The enchantment is good though, so I can see this one getting some use. And this is Mage Bane. Again, a nice looking emerald sword. And finally, this is Skull Crusher. Probably an apt name, to be honest. Pushing the quest further will lead us to someone called Erden who will be carrying the fourth and final forge gem. Grab this along with his freaky looking mask and now we can head to the forge. Place all four gems into each of these slots and this will reignite the forge. And now you can drop the unenchanted sword into the centre which will reforge the sword of true flame. This is the Reforged Sword, which has appeared in Morrowind's Tribunal expansion and the Elder Scrolls Online. While it has a pretty standard fire damage enchantment, it is unique as it has infinite uses and never needs to be charged, which may swing your decision towards the sword. And if not that, I mean look at how cool it looks when wielded. This isn't the final weapon in our list though, we have one more to collect, which I think is weapon number 37. If you head back to the room with the matriarch in, speak to this dark elf here, Vespartha Toe. She can be recruited as a follower. Once she is following you, ask to trade some things with her, and she carries a unique axe, the cleaver of Saint Felms. Like a lot of the Anniversary Edition weapons, it burns the target, this time for 25 points, but it also absorbs 25 points of magic from the target, which makes it viable for spell swords. And that completes our list. One final thing is just to go through how to improve all of those. So the cleaver needs a dwarven metal ingot. Hope's fire also requires a dwarven metal ingot. The light of day mace needs an iron ingot. For Mage Bane, it is refined moonstone. To improve Skull Crusher, it's a steel ingot. And finally, True Flame is a dwarven metal ingot. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it useful and it inspired you to go out and collect some of these yourself. I am Mike the Gaming Dad, and I will see you next time.